introduce our guest with us tonight now from Fort Worth, Warden Lou Gingler, Child Development Specialist Terry Gaddings, and the inmate Martha Lazoya. From Seagaville, Associate Warden E.J. Larson, Child Development Specialist Judy Allen, inmates Tony Catterin and Morris Key. From Dallas is Jan Jackson, co-director for the City of Dallas Ex-Offender Program. Now, I visited Seagaville. I went out with Mary Green and visited the program. It seemed like a good program to me. It seemed like the people involved in the program thought it was a good program. But Mary Green, as I said at the outset, has been connected with it from the word go. And I'd like for Mary just to kind of crank it off, if she will. How is the program going? What, how can it benefit the, pro, uh, the uh, cities in which it's located? Okay, thank you, Mike. Um, first, I would just like to say it's been some time since the film was made, and many of the persons that were shown in the film are no longer incarcerated, and many Which of is them. a good are, sign. Right, many of them are out on the streets or in the free world, as they say, and there's some real success stories, and there's some stories that aren't quite so successful. But I think that it would be better if the story were told by those that participate in the program. And Tony, may I start with you and direct a question to you? You are a parent, you are a tutor in the program. What does the program mean to you at Seagaville? Well, the, the program uh, has a multitude of benefits and uh, some uh, to me personally and uh, uh, many to the children themselves. Uh, to me, the uh, time spent tutoring is time spent outside of prison. Uh, I feel very comfortable with the children. I feel like I'm doing some good. And, uh, and a lot of times you see the good that you're doing. You know, the, uh, you see some of the kids that come into the program sort of introverted and uh, as you work with them and everything, you see them coming out of their shell. And that's from lack of, uh, you know, they're in a one parent situation at home. And a lot of them uh, really miss their, uh, the father image. And I think that uh, the tutors, such as myself, we, uh, we take that place. All right, let me just clarify one thing. You say that the time spent is like being out of the prison, but the program itself literally is inside the institution. It's definitely inside the institution. Okay, okay. And Mary, you know, it's not many instances an inmate will have uh, joy or feel like being happy, but uh, that attitude changes once we're upstairs with the kids or out on the playground. Uh, you sort of forget where you are. Martha, do you have the same sort of feelings over in Fort Worth? Yes, sir. Well, how about the uh, staff members here tonight? How is it, uh, uh, from your point of view, is it as successful, as uh, profitable as the inmates seem to think, Warden Gingler? Well, I don't think there's any doubt in anybody's mind that uh, the program itself, number one, has eased a lot of tension in the visiting room, which, as Mary knows, is how this, thing all got kicked, this whole thing got kicked off uh, over at Fort Worth. The uh, tolerance level, the noise level is much less. I think the parents are able to uh, have a more meaningful visit uh, with each other. And I think one of the great advantages is that it does afford privacy uh, to the parents. There's no question also in my mind that I think some of the people who got involved in this program have, have almost made a 180 degree turn inside the institution. Uh, they've come a long way. Uh, our people notice growth on the part of many of them. But I guess I'm enough of a pragma pragmatist to, to hope that what is learned inside the institution, as someone has said, and what is transmitted to the kids in there, hopefully when the people get out and find themselves in a real life situation, that many of these principles, many of these feelings, these emotions, the satisfaction that is obtained inside is then obtained by the same people working in connection with their own children or others. And I think therein lies, I think, uh, you know, the proof of the pudding. And you pointed to some great success stories which we can do equally well, and others who maybe not have done so well. I would just hope, and I recognize that the program is somewhat in its infancy, if you will, but I would hope that somewhere we can build in some research to demonstrate that, yes, uh, this is carried on outside the gates or the walls once the individuals are released. And I think that has some of the greatest potential of any programs we've had. 
uh, from a management standpoint, it's, uh, it's well received, well respected, and I appreciate the good that the program has done for us inside and think that it can be shown that uh, it does equally well outside. Could I ask Jan? Jan was in the film and has since been released and now is co-director of an ex-offender program for the city of Dallas. Has, in fact, the things that Mr. Gingler pointed to happened um, in your life? Yes, very much so. For one reason, though, the program while I was incarcerated in a, at uh, Seagalville was that we were there and the kids and our wives would come out and see us. We were the one that had committed the crime. And they would have to suffer through this also by visiting us those eight hours. And uh, like in the film, Lonnie stated that the turmoil and confusion in the visiting room led to the implementation of the uh, Sesame Street program. And my involvement, uh, because I was in the administrative part of the program, has led to see the insight of what is needed for a person incarcerated and his family outside. And so now that I'm working into the program that I am the co-director of, that's what we are doing now. We are working to try to close that gap between the uh, family outside and the incarcerated individual, as well as put together the uh, visiting of his children into the program also. Do you feel like you got uh, closer to your own family? I mean, are you closer to your kids now than, yeah. you know, did what you learned in the program help that? Yes, yes, I would say so also on that. Because uh, if I'm just visiting with my wife and my uh, daughter, she comes out and the only thing she can do is just sit around and listen to us talk. Well, she's going to have a tendency to kind of get away from us. She's not really interested in that, what we are talking about. Well, like the Sesame Street program, we could go up and get involved with uh, her. You know, we could feel her and she could feel us. Same way, yes, of course. I you know, there'd be a, a period of time there, like uh, being incarcerated for a year or two years, that you would mm -hmm. lose track of uh, of your children. And mm -hmm. the way by by being allowed to work with children, we don't we don't lose that gap. If anything, we overfill it. In other words, we get to know more about children, get to know more about raising them, their likes, dislikes. Uh, you know, uh, we actually educate. We're educating them, and then. I'm hoping that this helps me with my children uh, in the future as yours. Yes, right. Yeah. I've had many residents come to me and state this. They say, I want to be in the program because I feel this two or three year period that I've been incarcerated, I've completely lost what parenting skills I've had. And I need to strengthen the ones that I remember. I went on furlough and the child had changed. So I was left in, they were two and three, and now they're six, seven, and eight. I do not know how to cope. And so a lot of times we just discuss problems and the group throws them around. How would you handle? It's been very beneficial for them. That puts a tremendous strain on family unity. And uh, I think we'll find a new trend in corrections will be towards, geared more towards family unity. And uh, a program of this nature is very beneficial. Well, I, you know, Kitty, go ahead. <laughs> I just started to say we talked about the tutors and the children, what benefit they get from it. We get many positive reports from the visitors themselves, from the inmates that, uh, whose visitors are out there. And uh, they go in and observe the program, and uh, they like the idea that their children have a constructive playtime, you might say, that there's something there that the children are learning from. and. Uh, it gives their children, the children are really anxious to get out there. And we visit two evenings a week and on the weekends, and uh, the children are really anxious. But the visitors themselves really appreciate the program, and not just because it gets the kids away from them, but the fact that uh, it is constructive. The children are learning things. They're seeing things different, and uh, they look upon the, the incarceration of the inmate in a completely different light. So the policy at Sigaville and Mr. Larson, uh, as far as administration is concerned, is 100% support for this program? Oh, I would say when you say 100%, you've got to realize there may be one or two people, staff or inmates, that's not going to agree with you. But uh, I would say the administration is definitely 100% behind it. And uh, I would say the staff is practically 100%. But there's always someone, you know, say, well, I don't think it's doing anything. but. Uh, I don't think you'll find any program anywhere inside or out that's not this way, but it's uh, a very positive program. I think Mr. Gingler's pretty well stated uh, the administration's feeling at Seagullville also.
It's be interesting to put that same person who might criticize, let them work the visioning room when they've got 30, 40 screaming kids in there and see how willing that individual would be to have somebody kind of take these little kids out and put them somewhere else and let him run a smooth visiting room. I think one thing EJ pointed to that needs some more attention, that is the fact we've talked about what it does for the administration, what it does for the tutors, but I think we're overlook overlooking what it does many times for the kids themselves who are really in a situation where they can be observed, where they've got tutors who a little bit know a little bit about uh, child development, who can perhaps uh, capitalize on some of the the strengths that these kids have and maybe help them with some of the weaknesses that despite the fact it's a short period of time they can still detect those and I think here's another benefit of the program that too oftentimes is overlooked uh, who knows but what you may have a genius in the budding in one of those visiting rooms in one of these Sesame Street productions and it takes a just an, another sensitive eye an objective eye if you will to kind of note that here's a pretty exceptional kid or the reverse here's a kid who maybe has a uh, problem seeing and you're able to tell in the use of a color book that this kid maybe needs some attention maybe a doctor can so i think we're overlooking what it does for the kids themselves many times and we should never lose track of that of course we've had children coming in with speech severe speech problems and we've been able to through community resources find services available and they are helped and it's very rewarding to the tutors and myself judy has pointed out to me several times children that they've been able to help and they've noticed and uh, Judy can probably give us some Yeah, we had one particular child, um, one of the tutor's children and his family lived in the valley and uh, the mother was quite concerned that the child might have a learning disability. So we got on the phone with the uh, Texas Association for Children with Learning Disabilities and uh, hooked into San Antonio which was the closest place and they got connections that way and had the child tested and uh, he felt very much better about it but this all he all started thinking about this after watching a, we watched a special one night at our training session it was on children with learning disabilities he said that just fits my child and sure enough it did so, what sort of support though um, back to the start have you gotten from uh, we talked about the child the inmate and the administration what about from the uh, community standpoint, Fort Worth, Sigville, and Dallas? I mean, is, uh, are they behind it? Do they know anything about it? Uh, Mr. Jackson here now works right there. I mean, what kind of support are they giving? Should they give any support? Is it important to the community? We are supported enormously. Uh, I co-teach at the junior college in Fort Worth, and they supply us. In fact, they come in and uh, co-sponsor our program three times or twice a year. And they, I have films, they loan me uh, all kind of media. I uh, speak to many specialists in the field through uh, workshops that I attend. And they are all excited about the program. They all want to know how it's coming, how the one at Sigaville is, um, what our new developments are, who's active, who's not, and they're just very enthusiastic about it. Is your program uh, kind of I gather helps inmates when they come out, mm -hmm. no longer inmates, find jobs and, uh, right. and a way to go outside. Do you, where do your jobs come from? I mean, do, do you just have a flood of Dallas uh, or wherever su support coming, like I've got a job over here at this plant and so forth? Is, it, is that the way it works? No, our program basically works. We have job developers in our program. It goes out into community and talk with prospective employers about the uh, training that an inmate receive while he's incarcerated. And uh, doing this, try, we try to work to show the employer where if he gives that inmate a chance, or rather the ex-offender a chance, to come out and put his skills to work that he have received training for in the institution, he can be successful and stay out. But if he comes out and he doesn't have a job, or he doesn't have a place to go, or his family is gone, he have nothing to do then more than likely he will probably end up committing another crime going back to the institution. And our program is trying to alleviate that now. We're in the process of doing that, as well as working with his family while he's incarcerated. Because that's a real strain for the uh, breadwinner of the family to be incarcerated and the family is left alone with no one to uh, assist them. That's what we're doing. That goes back to what Mr. Gingler was saying about the strengthening of the family and and I think there's some additional things that we can do with this program in helping to support that family through the community um, in which that family resides. 
Judy, would you share with us some of the things that that go with the training, and Terry too? Um, we're not teaching welding or, or carpentry or any of those kind of saleable skills on the outside. There are some that could go into the child development field. But I think, as Mr. Gingler said, those skills that you carry with you back to your home and to your community. But would you share yeah, some of those? We started a program <clears throat> uh, last Thursday where the men will be going out in groups of 10 to visit different child care centers in the Dallas area. And this will go on for eight weeks. And um, it was, we took our first visit last Thursday. And a lot of the men had never been to a child care center before. It was really you know, an eye opener for some of them. And um, back to the community support, every center that I call to make arrangements with, very excited about us coming and um, want us to come back and do a puppet show. And that's one thing our group does. They go out into the community and put on puppet shows and clown shows for different agencies. They've been to Skyish Wright Hospital several times to do shows for the children there. And, um, that's our kind of our community activity. Are like there that. some needs that the families of the men and women, uh, Martha, um, at Fort Worth and again at, at Seagaville, <coughs> excuse me, that the families have that the community could lend support to? Do you mm -hmm. know, are there immediate problems that a woman incarcerated in Fort Worth has that needs the support of the Fort Worth community? Yes, outside of the institution. Could you speak to that for a minute? Well... You're talking, Mary, about maybe what the family might need that... Right. Right. That right. Something that, that, that the mother who's incarcerated who has three children that are being kept by a relative, you know, are there needs that those children have that visit your center that you become aware of certain kinds of problems. Maybe they need food stamps, or maybe they need daycare so that the person caring for them can, um, can go to work or something. You know, do you see a need for the extension, I guess, of the thing that I'm saying, an extension of the program so that it becomes a community-based program, not just something within the institution, but something then that takes the problems that we recognize within the institution and the families, as Jan pointed out, and calls upon the community in which we live to meet those problems. Many times our parents come with us, unlike Seagaville, their child development Sesame Street room is off the visitor room. Ours is <coughs> deep in the institution. Many of the parents want to have that time alone or sometimes they come with us. And I would say that out of the children that visit half are Mexican-American, and I would say a fourth are not bilingual. And so our Spanish-speaking tutors, it's a great asset. Uh, myself and uh, Q. Jack Cohn, who's my assistant, neither of us speak Spanish. And when you go through three or four locked bars, they begin to cry, we, we begin to lose them one by one, they're ready to go back. And this has been a great aid to us, to find mm -hmm. these women that are just, you know, dying to be in the program, very enthusiastic, and they have something so warm to share with these children. I think, Mary, that we haven't elevated to that point that you're talking about uh, to where we could be uh, a little bit more beneficial to the, uh, to the uh, inmates' wives in the community. But uh, I think that we're getting ourselves at Siegelville to a position that if we see a need, uh, we discuss it in our meetings or we discuss it with Judy and uh, we make some plans to uh, try to help them. You know, I think that, that that is an extension of what we're doing now. It would be a real uh, worthwhile extension to, you know, if someone needed food stamps, if we could go ahead and help. I think that there have been a couple physical defects or handicaps picked up, and uh, they've been pr uh, pursued, you know, directed to the right uh, program that could help the families. But I think to get down to the real basics, there are families that need uh, food and children that need food and uh, toys and stuff like that, which we do. We have Christmas programs and we had a Easter program that was just, I mean, it was phenomenal. It was one yeah, of the greatest parties that, I've yeah. ever seen in my life. And <coughs> when you talk about community help, we had so much uh, cold drinks and ice cream and, and 
potato chips, and I mean, you name it. We had so much donated, we couldn't, I mean, the kids, it, it was a fuel day for them. And we're planning another one like come uh, Labor Day. And, you know, and, and this was all community input. This was mm -hmm. the donations. We have another advantage at, I think, Fort Worth, too, and that is that we have in the table of organization a separate community programs branch headed up by a department head. We've given the department head level, and that particular individual has uh, three full-time staff members working for him, and that same uh, division is responsible for all community-based programs, work release, study release, uh, work release combination training, whatever. And uh, in the event uh, that a, a need is seen uh, in a family that comes out of the, uh, the workshop to Sesame Street, we have four people in there who have the ability to channel or to refer the people who need help into a community agency in Fort Worth, Dallas, or even in adjoining cities. So we've built, in a sense, a whole department at the institution which right. can serve as a referral yeah, service. that's out of sight. And uh, as a result, we get many uh, referrals down to agencies and uh, involving uh, clothing, food, uh, education, testing, the whole gamut, in fact. So what you were talking about, Morris, about the institution finally becoming more aware, not only of the mandate by Congress for the incarceration of, of the person committing a crime, but an extension of that, that mandate into someone assuming the responsibility of the family, of right. the person mm -hmm. that's incarcerated. Right. I, I feel right. it should start on, on a court level, though. And, uh, Tell me about what on. you mean by court level. Well, you know, when you're arrested and, and when you're first in a court, and uh, like I was found guilty, I've never been back home since. And the car was left in a parking lot. And uh, I think, you know, someone should have been there with me to let my family know, you know, where they can go for this, that, or the other in the event they needed help. But uh, that's missing. And, uh, Mr. Larson, it's a big is that. Gap. What does the Bureau, it's not fair to maybe ask you this, but, but I know that your mandate is the incarceration, but, you know, who is responsible for what Morris has just, just spoken to? I know it's the community's responsibility, but, you know, how do we, how do we work through that? Well, a particular problem like he's talking about, uh, that would be hard to say who was definitely responsible back in that area. Uh, I think getting back to our question of, community support that uh, the program we have now demonstrates basically this community report we support we get and that is Sesame Street mm -hmm. we have all kind of community re support and uh, I think it's very well demonstrated in the program because without Sesame Street and the community involvement there we wouldn't have the program we got now we're not uh, st staffed like uh, Fort Worth but we do have a program whereby that people in need are referred to the agency and our counselors we work on a team system and the counselors will go out with the inmate himself and uh, get with the people take them to the agency that is responsible in the community for that and we've had terrific support from the different local agencies on uh, helping people establish themselves wives will move up here from the valley with no support whatsoever and uh, we have no difficulty getting some help for them getting them a place to live and stay till they can get established. Uh, food and all the same way. Uh, the community's been very supportive. Of, uh, we depend on Dallas to a great extent because Seagull is rather small and uh, so most of our support and agencies are in Dallas itself. You're actually dealing with a real thin line here when you're talking mm -hmm. about, you know, who has responsibility in the case just mentioned. And, you know, you can get down and look at the letter of the law and you get into the appropriations, you get into the language of uh, appropriations and who can spend what. And of course, uh, that is a real hairy legalistic uh, decision that has to be made. To what extent can appropriated funds going to Bureau of Prisons be used, let's say, for welfare? And I think the, the Bureau's position has been we are not, in a sense, a welfare agency. On the other hand, I think we have a moral uh, responsibility for the people uh, who also belong to our people in a sense of having the responsibility to, uh, re responsibility to refer them to other agencies who are legally and also morally equipped uh, to help them. And uh, I think that's why you may find in the literature somewhere that, you know, the Bureau of Prisons is not a, a welfare agency. Well, 
certainly isn't, and that's strictly a legalistic deter uh, decision that has been made, but there's nothing to say that we can't in turn serve as a resource, a referral agency, let's say, to other agencies who are legally, financially equipped to take care of it. I think that's essentially what we've done at Fort Worth. I think that's one of the faults of the criminal justice system. Uh, they don't carry on a smooth system. I think we get more of a benefit being at a minimum security prison as your prison is and our prison, uh, and we get more of these benefits, but, you know, if you get to a, a maximum security prison, I'd almost bet that they don't have near the outlet that we have. Well, I think you'll find less community involvement for one reason or another. Uh, you'll find a more receptive public, if you will, here in this metroplex than you would, let's say, at uh, Atlanta, Georgia, or Leavenworth, Kansas, where you have the maximum security institutions and all that <laughs> those names uh, imply. Uh, and a thousand or twelve hundred inmates. Mm -hmm. in a thousand or two thousand. Mm -hmm. In mm -hmm. twenty, thirty to life to, to do. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, Jan, you were trying to say Yeah, something. well, I was only wanting to say if a guy is incarcerated, say he lives in Dallas, and he's incarcerated and shipped to Terry Hutt, and he stays in Terry Hutt for two years, when he comes back to Dallas, he really don't know what's available in the community for him. Uh, I would say more uh, programs inclined to help the incarcerated individual once he's released, as well as assisting his family while he is incarcerated. More of those programs need to be made aware, and uh, I would say the information needs to be put on the inside of the institution where the incarcerated individual can contact these agencies or have his family to contact these agencies so that when he is released, he can have somewhere to go, possibly a job to go to, and some other little small necessities he will have to take care of. Mary, aren't we in the process of a book that you're right. working on? Right. That very thing. Right. Mm -hmm. That will be yeah. given directly to the inmate and the inmate's family, uh, both here in the county. Mary, uh, if you will, you, you've been, this is more or less uh, uh, your program. Are you satisfied? Um, whatever word you want to use with the progress it's making. What else could it be doing? I mean, we've talked about a few things, about extension and so forth, but you're pretty well uh, uh, pleased, you, or do you think there's a whole lot more that you could be doing? I think the work that's been done at Seagoville and Fort Worth has, has been excellent, and the support of the staff and the inmates and, and the families and persons such as Terry and Judy who, who give of themselves a great deal in the training and working with the children and the inmates. Um, I think we still have a long way to go to, to do what we've just shared in the last few minutes, talking about the family. And I'm not saying that is the Bureau of Prisons' responsibility, but I do think that we need to look into that criminal justice system and how, because we know that, that recidivism, returning to prison, is caused by not having a job and by not having strong family ties. And, you know, if we're willing to look at that realistically and to say that we do not want this person to return, then I think someone has responsibility. And I would like for us to explore that, not as a Bureau of Prisons project particularly, but as a community project. And then to deal more with the family, uh, a family institute, um, maybe a conference all day at Fort Worth and Dallas, talking about these problems, inviting the community in, this kind of thing. Mary, uh, it seems that, you know, some inmates come from some of the other prisons and they really get uh, excited about our program. Uh, are you doing anything about getting this into some of the others? It's going into other institutions. That's all. Go ahead. We're going into six other, we're in six other federal prisons now, getting calls from state institutions, so we're moving on. Okay, that's great. size of it, folks. <laughs> <laughs>